And these fellows will make Jerry sit up if they get half a chance. Now equipped with uniforms and rifles, they're the home guard. And instructors are demonstrating the P-14 rifle. Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range. This here is a Winchester made Patton 1914 rifle. Uh, reassigned number three in the 1920s when they changed the terminology. Now there's an awful lot of stuff and nonsense and half truth about these that go around the place. So uh, let's start at the start. Now in the Boer War there were some long range engagements between British troops armed with uh, Lee Metfords and Lee Enfields, Long Lee Enfields, uh, and it really got into the uh, the public mind and the army's mind that uh, long range engagements were the norm. And it's a, a general truism with armies that they uh, re-equip and retrain to refight the last war. So, I mean, in reality, most engagements were 600 yards and less, and uh, this isn't something to go into here. Anyway, what happened was that the the, the, the perception was long-range engagements are great, they are the future, they're what's happening, we need a rifle so that the individual rifleman can engage point targets out to zillion hundred meters. Um, there was also a large faction in the shooting community and uh, in the military that liked Mausers because the Boers had been shooting Mausers, therefore good. Um, actually, the Boers were basically guerrillas and using cover very well and it took a while to learn how to deal with it, but uh, remind me who won in the end. So, anyway, uh, out of the Boer War there were updates that came to the normal British service rifle, which ended up with the uh, SMLE, which everyone by now who's watching this channel should hopefully know, if not there's a zillion videos out there, um, and the charger loading Lee Enfield for the, for the, for the territorials, and they basically took the long Lees and they put charger guides on them, improved front sights, adjustable, individual zeroing of rifles was a big deal, and um, a focus in the training on marksmanship. Now what else happened uh, sometime after 1910 was the Pattern 13 program. And this was basically, we want a Mauser type rifle with a super mega crazy cartridge uh, so that we can refight the Boer War and have individual marksmen picking off Boers behind rocks at a thousand yards or whatever. Anyway, the cartridge they came up with was was uh, two was a point two seven six, so about a seven millimeter cartridge, uh, equivalent in ballistics more or less to the modern seven millimeter Remington Magnum, except at the time they didn't really have the metallurgy or the powder technology to deal with such ballistics without some serious issues. Um, the first of which being flash and blast, well flash cordite is particularly flashy powder, uh, blast it's a high pressure cartridge, you can't really avoid that aside from having a ridiculously long barrel. Um, metallic fouling, major issue, basically the faster you're pushing it the higher the pressure, the hotter the powder, the more problems you're going to get with metallic fouling in the era. They really hadn't developed the modern low powder fouling, low uh, metallic fouling um, powders. The, in fact, the irony was to use tin as an additive. Uh, but anyway, so uh, what they did was they made, they designed the Pat 13 rifle, which is broadly similar to this, and we'll come along to it in a moment. And then in the run up to World War One, the project was dropped. Uh, basically, they couldn't solve the uh, issues with the ammunition. Um, another problem with having massively powerful ammunition is that the rifle gets very, very hot very, very quickly, and there are reports of cook-offs. I mean, cook-offs as in, as in a chambered round exploding just from the heat of the rifle when it's sitting in the chamber. This is normally something associated with machine guns, and to have it happen, allegedly, in a bolt-action rifle is pretty crazy. Um, it also means you get massive heat haze, um, and when a rifle gets too hot, it doesn't shoot straight anyway, typically, so um, big issues. Uh, there's a lot of wishful thinking that says that had the First World War not intervened, Britain would have adopted the P-13 rifle, maybe with reduced ballistics. Now, my position on this is a little more nuanced and a little more sceptical. must remember that, let's say in 1914, 
Uh, the British Army has gone through a massive set of changes. We adopted um, the Lee Metford in 1888, we changed ammunition, we adopted uh, the cordite loaded ammunition instead of black powder in 1892, from about 1895 if I remember rightly. We've got the first marks of Lee Enfield coming in, then in 1901 we've got the SMLE Mark I, around the same time we're converting the remaining long Lees into charger loading Lee Enfields. Um, and then in 1907 we got the Leonfield Mark III and then we've had several marks of ammunition that have basically gone in a circle and then back where they are but that's not for today. Uh, then in 1910 we've got Mark VII ammunition which is the cartridge that served for the majority of uh, the, the lifetime of the 303 so right up until the end so in principle served from about 1910 until the last uh, number 4T sniper rifles went out in the 70s. Um, and then we're, what? We're gonna we're gonna adopt a whole new rifle that's totally different and only has five rounds instead of ten and new ammunition. And but we've just adopted a new ammunition just a few years prior. And okay, oh, but this new ammunition, flash and bang and two hot and doesn't work very well. Fouls the rifles. It's horrible. Okay, why don't we wind the ballistics back a little bit? Okay, so we've gone from uh, so what was it, 160 grains at about 2800 feet per second. Well, let's take a few hundred feet per second off of that. Let's wind it back. I wonder if, if we wind it back down to say 2600, if we then solve the primer issues, uh, solve the, the, the fouling issues and the heating issues, and then war were declared and it's all forgotten. But let's imagine that war were not declared and compare from a sort of bean counting perspective what we're looking at here now. So we've just adopted a brand new shiny um, Spitzer cartridge 303 Mark 7 in 1910 and it's 174 grain for the era it's got a really good ballistic coefficient despite being flat base um, so it's good for long range machine gunnery um, and it's doing 2440 feet per second at the rifle so we're going to change all the ammunition over to go for a lighter bullet with probably a slightly better ballistic coefficient I haven't got the figures in my head um, doing only a couple hundred feet per second more so what have we gained from this. I mean, we've gained a couple of hundred feet per second and we've and people will be screaming, but rim jams at me. But you must remember that the rim jam issue by this point was solved with the the later effectively solved with the later uh, patents of magazine and the uh, the bevel on the rim. And I have some uh, some here. Nice bevel rim we're going to do a little test with this rifle in a minute. So I don't think that P13 with slightly softened ballistics was ever an economically viable perspective, particularly with uh, the idea of 15 rounds rapid, 10 rounds in the magazine being good, irrespective of the other advantages of the rifle. So what happened was during the war, Britain, well, just like every country, needed lots and lots and lots of arms. Uh, they had this design. Uh, the SMLE design was a bit based in 19th century manufacturing. This design was a bit more modern in the manufacturing, so we went to the States and subcontracted out to Winchester and Remington, um, the Edisonne factory as, uh, as well. And uh, they built the rifle in, same, basically the same rifle, in 303 British. And this is what we have here. This is a Winchester made one. Uh, no idea on the, on the date, uh, but what's interesting is that this one went through Whedon in the early Second World War and it has been upgraded, in inverted commas, to the Whedon Repair Standard. Now, uh, if we just go over the rifle briefly, I mean there's, there's plenty of other content out there about it, but uh, we'll give it the full bloke on the range uh, nerdy treatment. It is basically a hybrid between um, a Mauser 98, a 1903 Springfield, and there's certain uh, ergonomic Adaptations taken off from the Lee Enfield, so it's a kind of unholy godchild of three different, three different rifles. Plus, there's some new stuff uh, in there. So uh, let us start at the back. The butt shape is Lee Enfield. This was uh, very much liked, very much favoured. Reasonable for shooting, reasonable for uh, uh, for holding for bayonet fighting. The bolt is. Very, very reminiscent of a, of a Mauser 98. The release is exactly the same. And uh, 
we pull it out and it's front locking looks from there forward it's basically looks like a 98 the extractor's a slightly different profile but meh so what gas handling like a Mauser 98 it is however cock on closing gosh gas yes it is a cock on closing type because the uh, British uh, considered, and I, in my opinion, quite rightly, the cock on closing helps with the rapid fire, which was very important. Now, another interesting thing on the receiver here is that uh, we've got a fairly small thumb cut out for stripping the rounds out of the out of the charger into the magazine, and this is something that seems to be taken over from the 1903 Springfield. And I must say that SMLEs and uh, uh, number fours and Mauser 98s are far easier to operate the stripper clips on, partly because this tends to get a little bit in the way of your thumb. Also up this end we have the bit that is uh, robbed blatantly from the 1903 Springfield. Uh, the primary extraction is inversed with respect to a Mauser 98. On a Mauser 98 you've just got the bolt handle hitting a cam surface in the receiver. Here you've got a, uh, a kind of uh, cam stud. Let's see if you can see that in there. and. Uh, I don't have a patented plastic pokey hand, but I have a cartridge. You've got that sort of, well it's not even a stud, that a little cam surface there, and then a big long cam surface on the bolt there. And this gives a much more powerful, much smoother uh, primary extraction to, 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 to shake a uh, sticky cartridge out from the rifle. That is a good plan. Uh, the bedding also seems to have been copied from the 1903 Springfield, but I'm not sufficiently informed on the 1903 Springfield bedding to, um, uh, to comment on this. There's an aspect we'll get to at the other end related to the bedding, but let's just keep moving forwards. Uh, originally, this will have had a long range sight, so called volley sight. As part of the Whedon repair, this was taken off. They also uh, got rid of the marking disc at the butt, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so this, this one still retains its, uh, its long range sight dial plate at the front. Uh, some of them that got new stocks were, uh, they got nothing there at all, it, uh, it's just a flat bit of wood. This one was, was not restocked, uh, any other stocks were in good enough condition they didn't uh, bother. Now the rear sight, this has the best, the best rear sight of any rifle of the period. Any, any production rifle of the period. You've got a 400 yard battle sight and then a flip up ladder which is marked from 200 to uh, uh, 1650 yards and uh, adjustable in, in, uh, in steps. In fact you can just about put it between, yeah, you can put it between if you want. Um, extremely well protected. I mean, you you would you would uh, have to be very unlucky to damage to damage that. Uh, interesting point on the American M1917s. I believe they didn't change the height of that, so with the uh, flatter trajectory of uh, 3006 uh, ammo of the era, it's about 450 yards, I believe. Um, receiver ring is very Mauser. Handguard all the way up to the front. And then let's get up the front, kind of Mauser Springfield style. But unlike the actual Mauser 98, it is pressure bedded onto the fore end, like the later number four. They've really, by this point, they've really got got to grips with what was needed to make a light barrel shoot straight. And their front sight's extremely well protected, uh, windage adjustable front sight with a drift so that the rifle could be uh, zeroed to the individual and which was a major major bit of uh, uh, lessons learned from the Boer War. During World War I uh, they, were, they only ever saw frontline service as marksman's rifles some of them have what's called a fine sight that's a number uh, P pattern 14 mark 1 F. Uh, late in the war some were mounted with telescopic sights and uh, they served as late as uh, World War II. That's the Pat 14 uh, Part 1T. Uh, they were not parts interchangeable between the factories, and they were marked accordingly. This has a W serial number, so you know it's 
from, uh, from Winchester. It's something that uh, when the American governments asked the same factories to convert them to 3006 and start producing them for the Americans, they insisted on complete parts interchangeability, but, uh, which they managed to do for the, for the M17, but the P14s are not. Uh, long story as to, as to why not, but uh, yeah, basically wartime. Uh, wartime conditions and constraints, and we just need rifles. In the end, in World War One, they were only ever used in, 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 in training, and as I said, as marksmen and sniper sniper rifles. Sniper rifles used as late as World War Two, and they were expected to shoot three inches at 100 yards. The later number four Mark One Ts were expected to uh, to shoot two and a half. Um, and then in the Second World War, they were all refurbed at Weeden, so Weeden Repair Standard. Uh, they were used in training and with the home guard and they feature in the in the training manuals and aiming with the aperture sight the early training manuals the number four didn't start coming in until later in the war aside from the uh, the few trials ones and um i don't believe in the western theater of operations they saw combat there's some rumors that some early commando raids had them but the pictures could be training photos um, i've seen combat footage in the far east with some um, but yeah, otherwise uh, they saw very, very little combat use. Post World War One, um, these rifles were just most of them were put into store, and a, uh, a certain number were given to the newly independent Baltic states. And so they turn up in German hands, and they've got a German. Uh, in fact, they've got multiple German captured weapon codes, depending on who they were captured from. Even when they're the same rifles, this is typical typical uh, German military uh, nonsense but uh, yeah but they were very much considered to be the second choice rifle and after the war these were not developed further although there were some prototypes based on cutting them down because they had a million or so of them in stock so do something with them um, and development of the 303 service rifle continued from the SMLE and not from this and uh, yeah, I know some people think these are better, but I've uh, not personally had a lot of experience with them. So uh, let's have a look at a few particular things on it and uh, put a few rounds through it. About bloody time. Yeah, I'll shut up. Okay, now uh, looking at one of the rumours about these, it's Blanc on the range, we take no one's word for things that we can test, so we can test it. They're reported to be kind of rim jammy compared to uh, SMLE, so I've got some of the 1943 cased ammunition loaded in charges in the correct down up down up down fashion according to the manual it's the same charger clip as the uh, SMLE so let's see if this right let's see if this is in fact rim jammy now what we do what we have here if uh, you can bring the camera in we have a rim jam so the top the, the rim of the top round is behind the rim of the round below. The next, the question is that will the uh, the magic uh, radius or chamfer? No. <laughs> Worked as designed. Oh yeah, one one thing I forgot to mention is that the uh, the bolt handle is cranked back to put it in the same relation to the trigger as on an SMLE. Well, that was interesting. Another one for good luck. It? Yeah, well, again, down, up, down, up, down. Shall we just rob the point home here? Go on. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we've got a charger loaded uh, rim over rim and backwards, so. Heresy. The most incorrect way possible. It's not as smooth as an SMLE, getting them in, I must say, it's really not. Okay, so, <laughs> in fact, this one... What have we got? <laughs> it's been ordered correctly, we've got rim on rim there. Yeah. So let's just, let's just make this, try and make this a rim jam. He says, can we deliberately stuff this up? Mm. No, we can't. <laughs> It works as intended, and what's interesting is that, that uh, the control, the control feed, with that, with with the, with the different profile on the extractor compared to a Mauser 98, that control feed is uh, is rather on the on the 
on the more efficient uh, side. In the uh, in the German military manuals, it states that you that you must push it all the way forward and pull it back because it doesn't always go. Let's try and stuff that up again. Did you have your Weetabix this morning? No, I'm on a diet still. <laughs> right, let us deliberately. There we go. I've deliberately pushed the last round in. Well, I behind. confirm this. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Confirm that it is behind. Ta da! Ta da! Can we please put 303 rim jams to bed, please? Just because. Just because SB or whatever. Let's, let's do it with SB. Modern ammunition. Regulation fashion. I'm probably boring everyone to death with this by now. It's going to be the longest video on the P14 ever. Right. Uh, SMB non radius rims. Regulation fashion. This is going to rim jam like a sod if it goes in wrong. Oh, that's going in all right. Let's deliberately rim jam it. Deliberate rim jam. goes. <laughs> You'd think they designed the magazine geometry right. As soon as I press it too far, it just pops back up in order. Nah. I can't make to. this rim jam. I cannot make this rifle rim jam. <laughs> right, we're finally going to shoot. Yep. Right, you'll be glad to know I finally shut up, almost. So, uh, Zip what it. Gonna do? Zip. No, all right, carry on. <laughs> so what we're going to do is um, let the rifle do some talking. Blah, with a sticky clip. Go in. It really does not load as neatly as an SMLE. A clip of cartridges is gripped in on the charger guide and loaded into the magazine. The boat's closed and the rifle's ready for firing. Loading. Push forward the safety catch. Pull back the bolt. Take a clip of cartridges. Press the cartridges down with the thumb of the right hand until all five are lodged in the magazine. Close the bolt and apply the safety catch. One charger flick. Two chargers in the position and... We're going to use the battle site at 50 metres off hand. Still got that K31 head flick. <laughs> Alright. Perfectly adequate for uh, military use. Nespa. I concur. Um, yeah. I mean aside from aside from the fact that using the magazine is uh, is harder than with an SMLE, certainly getting getting the rounds in, and there's no Really okay. There's a little bit of relief for the thumb there, but not very much at all. You can't. You really can't get a good purchase on it. Uh, I'd say that's a slight drawback. Five rounds rather than ten. Yeah, but certainly in the shooting, it's the fact that the bolt stroke is long because it's designed for a massive, great long 276 cartridge. I can't say I noticed it particularly. Um, the sight picture is just awesome. For, for, for a pre-First World War design, this is just a mind-gargling,ly awesome sight picture. So uh, I think that will do for this video. In a later video, we shall mad minute it. It will be up in a number of weeks or months. However, this rifle isn't going to get a chance to cool off in between for us. So uh, yeah. Anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for tolerating my blathering. Uh, thank you very much to the organisation here for uh, allowing us to film on their range. And uh, please consider supporting us on Patreon, which means we can come down here and film stuff like this for your delight and delectation. So uh, thank you very much. Bye.